Ketamine has been mainstream since the 70s, and it has a wild history, ranging from being a safer alternative to PCP used in anesthesia to being a popular club drug in the 90s. It has come a very long way because today it's not only used to treat severe depression, but also chronic pain. And these two issues are only the tip of the iceberg. So ketamine has been dubbed the master molecule. Let's find out why. So if a drug could have a rags to riches story or a zero to hero storyline, it would be ketamine. Ketamine's origin begins as phencyclidine, better known as PCP, which was first synthesized in 1956 by chemists at Park Davis. The problem with it initially was in testing, it was capable of causing drunkenness in rodents, delirium in dogs, and cataplectic states in pigeons, which basically means if you position them in a certain way, they remained in that indefinitely locked in a trance and incapable of moving on their own. So like a pigeon mannequin. Now it was also deemed to be a safe and reliable anesthetic in humans, but it also caused an intense prolonged delirium post anesthesia that ultimately nicks that. And then in the seventies and eighties, it made its way into the Vietnam war as a battlefield anesthetic and was also used in veterinary medicine where it was given the nickname that you might be a little more familiar with special K. It then gained popularity as a recreational drug due to its dissociative and hallucinogenic effects, which then carried on through the nineties and became known as angel dust from here researchers began exploring the potential antidepressant properties of ketamine and found that low doses administered intravenously had profound antidepressant effects. And this led to a shift in perception from a party drug to psychiatric medication. And this shift just kind of reminds me of the pharma, if you can't beat them, join them club. And those of you who are picking up what I'm putting down, drop a comment. And then finally in 2019, the FDA approved esketamine, brand name Sporvato, and used it as a treatment for adults with treatment resistant depression. After that, the sky was the limit because ketamine therapy has garnered so much attention for not only its potential in treating various mental health conditions, including anxiety and PTSD, but also conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, COVID-19 symptoms, and chronic pain. It works so well that scientists refer to it as the, the most, most important, important discovery, discovery in half, half a century. But aside from all of that, what else can ketamine do? Well, it's a world-class anti-inflammatory agent. It reduces chronic pain and swelling by inhibiting the release of specific immune cells called neutrophils. It also reduces toxic chemicals in the blood known as cytokines. Scientists are investigating IV administered ketamine's medical applications to determine its potential in treating conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, including Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. It also helps with chronic pain caused by other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, and neuropathic pain, which is a pain related to small and large fiber nerve damage. And according to recent research by the American Academy of Pain Medicine, ketamine has not only been proven effective as a standalone therapy, but also as an add-on to opioids. It's non-addictive, and because it's been found to reduce pain sensitivity, it can also enable the reduction of opioid use, making it especially appealing. Another possibility is that it may also assist people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, because it may slow down the progression of muscle wasting known as amyotrophy. Clinical trials are currently being conducted on ALS patients and other neurodegenerative disorders.
Ketamine therapy can reduce your stress response and improve immune function. So when we're stressed or anxious, our bodies release excess cortisol, which suppresses the immune system and causes us to become more vulnerable to disease. A ketamine infusion not only combats anxiety and depression, it also reduces the body's stress response by reducing cortisol production. And cortisol is a hormone that when it's off balance, it can cause issues like weight gain, acne, muscle weakness, thinning hair, slowed healing, etc. And when cortisol is produced, it enhances a person's ability to fight off severe infections and diseases because your immune system is optimized. It has been found that people who receive ketamine infusions experience an increase in natural killer T cells. These cells are responsible for killing off damaged or cancerous cells that could potentially grow into tumors. In addition, studies have shown that ketamine is safe and effective at not only helping people with autoimmune conditions, but also increasing a healthy person's immune response as well by reducing neutrophils and macrophages, which are these little Pac-Men over here. And macrophages are responsible for scooping up unhealthy cell debris, tumor cells, and toxins. It prevents local inflammation from worsening and spreading as well. So to put it another way, ketamine is immunomodulatory rather than immunosuppressive. Ketamine has brain regenerating properties. Honestly, ketamine may be one of the most versatile medicines in the world because it also has some really unique effects on our brains and spinal cords. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change and adapt over time in response to our environment, thoughts, and experiences. So for my manifesting champions out there, you know that when you focus on something, it will eventually become reality. Our brains can actually rewire themselves over time when we're doing this, and this is due to neuroplasticity. Our brains don't know the difference between something that is right in front of us versus something that we believe is in front of us. It cannot make that distinction. So it rapidly increases connections between brain cells. One of the ways it does this is by increasing levels of BDNF or brain derived neurotropic factor. And remember this for later because it will come up again. Studies have shown that this protein appears to play a role in the growth of new blood vessels and neurons. Ketamine can help repair brain function by promoting the regrowth of nerves in the hippocampus, which is responsible for learning and memory. It also reduces inflammation of the brain and spinal cord, so it may also be beneficial in treating conditions like Alzheimer's. It helps the brain rewire itself by creating or improving nerve connections, basically. And when neurons fire, they produce new connections that are called dendrites. And the more dendrites you have, the faster and better you learn new things. So it may help people with learning disabilities like ADHD too. Basically, it helps the brain to reboot itself, increasing our ability to remember specific details about past events while staying open to new experiences through our newly formed dendrite connections. Ketamine is a smart drug. Okay, so we know IV ketamine's effects on mood, but it also improves a person's cognitive function because it interacts with a chemical in the brain called glutamate, which is the most common neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. I bet a lot of you out there are saying, no, it's not, it's dopamine or it's serotonin. Mm -mm, it's glutamate. Glutamate directly affects attention, learning, memory, and motivation. So the combination of the glutamate interaction and the increase in BDNF acts as a sort of miracle grow in the prefrontal cortex, which is involved with complex reasoning, judgment, social behavior, and how we interpret events. 
So when we combine the two, the resulting improvement in cognitive performance may be dramatic. Ketamine therapy is being used to treat severe illnesses from COVID-19 and long COVID. So because ketamine is a super effective anti-inflammatory and improves immune function, researchers are now investigating its role in treating severe COVID-19 infections and post-COVID symptoms known as long COVID. So studies are underway to determine if patients who receive ketamine therapy for COVID-19 could fight off the virus-related inflammation that accompanies it and survive. And according to Dr. Matthew Sims, who's the director and principal investigator at the Infectious Disease Research Center at Beaumont Health in Michigan, there is an urgent need to develop new treatments for COVID-19 using easily available and affordable medications. Ideal new treatments for COVID-19 would help the progression of the disease in patients with mild cases before the need for ventilators and provide a rescue treatment for patients with severe cases of the virus. So long COVID is associated with a variety of physical and mental symptoms. We know this. These can include headaches, intense tiredness, memory and thinking difficulties, as well as muscular disability and joint discomfort. In addition to physical symptoms, long COVID sufferers also report things like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So treating episodes of depression, brain fog, and suicidal thoughts that accompany long COVID while at the same time providing physical relief from the pain and extreme fatigue, the potential here is huge. More work needs to be done in these investigations, but there's certainly a lot of hope. Now, ketamine infusion therapy can be helpful for those also recovering from addiction. Alcohol and illegal drug use are significant public health problems that are growing more serious by the day. In certain countries, owing to the increasing rates of opioid usage, mortality rates have skyrocketed to pandemic levels. The opioid epidemic has reached a new level of devastation in the United States, and between 1999 and 2021, nearly 645,000 people have died from overdoses involving any opioid, including prescription and illicit opioids, according to the CDC. In 2023, the global overdose death rate topped 112,000 in a 12-month period for the first time in history. So for comparison, in 2013, the Centers for Disease Control reported that there were more than 334 million prescriptions written for opioids annually. Between 2016 and 2019, opioid prescriptions declined overall by 44% or so. Now, I speak with countless chronic pain sufferers every day and have always been a proponent of opioids being prescribed appropriately for those who have documented conditions where pain is a known entity, and this includes post-operative prescribing. If any of you have watched the two videos I did on the top painful surgeries and looked through the comments, You've seen the horror stories of people who had major surgery and were told to take Advil. I have, a, I have a huge problem with this. I think in many cases, we've gone way too far in the other direction. I don't know, as a result of the war on drugs and overuse of prescription pain meds. But those who actually need them cannot get them. But this is a whole other video. Addiction and substance use disorders include cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms. The hallmark signs of addiction include impaired control, cravings, social impairment, risky use, and withdrawal symptoms. Ketamine treatment can help with addiction during rehabilitation by alleviating treatment-resistant depression and anxiety symptoms that often accompany withdrawal from the drug of abuse. More than that, 
ketamine may also help those recovering from drug or alcohol addiction because it affects specific brain pathways that can affect cravings. Researchers have found that a ketamine infusion can reduce the Q-induced craving for cocaine as well as methamphetamine. And a Q-induced craving, for those that don't know, is say someone is addicted to prescription pain meds and they see a pill bottle. That could trigger a an intense craving. And that pill bottle could maybe just be filled with antibiotics, but seeing that pill bottle, if they had previously associated it with the high that they got from opioids, it's an instantaneous trigger. It is automatic. So that's what a Q-induced craving is. Okay, so now that we've established how incredible and promising ketamine is, let's talk about how it's administered and some of the side effects. We have to have fair balance, you know, the good with the bad here. So earlier, I mentioned that the first FDA-approved version of ketamine is called Spravato, but this is a derivative of ketamine called S-ketamine, and this is available as an intranasal spray only. But this hasn't gotten the attention you would think, and that's because it's super expensive, and IV administration of ketamine is just far superior than any other delivery method, nasal oral, intramuscular, sublingual, meaning under the tongue. The bioavailability seen with these other administration routes is lower than that of dosing given directly into the bloodstream, which makes sense, right? So for example, intranasal delivery, which is spravato, only gives about 50% of what one would normally get through the IV route. Oral dosing has even less availability coming in at around 17 to 23%. So we'll typically start someone with what's called induction dosing, which means that we're introducing a drug to someone that starts at a safe and accepted baseline dose. And then we're gradually increasing or titrating once the provider sees how someone is responding and how their symptoms are reacting to whatever drug we're giving. Induction for ketamine is normally six to 10 treatments given two to three times a week over two to three weeks. The infusions last about 40 minutes and a trained medical team will monitor you the entire time. After induction, some people will remain symptom-free for months and be fine maintained on their other antidepressants or pain meds. Others will relapse or need maintenance dosing and maybe continue to get booster infusions maybe one to two times a month. The main commonly experienced side effects include dizziness, nausea, and persistent dissociative states, or basically randomly feeling like you're floating, which sounds awesome and terrifying all at the same time. Now, all in all, ketamine is actually better tolerated than most antidepressants, if you can believe that. But if that's the case, then why isn't everyone on it? Well, first, it's reserved for way more serious cases of depression and suicidal ideation. Some centers are also using it for intractable anxiety and other conditions like chronic pain, but these fall outside of the scope of FDA approval. So the only option here is to pay out of pocket for it because insurance won't cover it in these cases, and this will quickly add up. The average cost per session is somewhere between four and $800, and you multiply that by six sessions and you're looking at $2,400 to $4,800 for your first six induction doses alone. The upside here is that with this therapy, you'll know pretty quickly whether it's helping or not before you go down the rabbit hole of spending a small fortune. And consider this. There are people who are not only on several antidepressants that they fill on a monthly basis, many will also see a therapist simultaneously, and some sessions with a very experienced counselor can cost anywhere from $100 to $400 a session. So again, this therapy is something that needs a lot of consideration, 
The other alternative I also want to mention, though, I can't say it's a great substitute for monitored IV administered ketamine. There is a site called MindBloom, and it's an online clinic that will do an online evaluation and then send you oral ketamine in the mail for you to take it home. And then you have access to a virtual monitoring via Zoom or text or an app, I believe. And the potential issue here is you could only utilize the service if they have a provider that's licensed in your state on staff. And the only way to find that out is to join and provide all of your information, your email, et cetera, et cetera, and see. Then if everything's a go from that point, it's $89 a month and you get access to the monitoring for six treatments. Now, you might be saying that this sounds great so far and it may be, I don't know, but for whatever reason, it doesn't actually wind up costing only $267 because they charge you for three months, which totals just over a thousand. So the math doesn't quite math here, but if anyone has experience with Mindbloom, drop it in the comments. I'd love to know how, uh, how this service works and what the experience has been with it. Yes, it may ultimately be more affordable than sick treatments of IV ketamine, but recall the oral administration is less effective than the IV dosing. So I don't know. I don't know. For someone with intractable anxiety, like those with POTS and dysautonomia experience, this may absolutely be worth it as the anxiety with this condition is normally off the charts and goes undiagnosed for years because many people just think that these symptoms are either all in their head or the health providers that they're going to for help may not be familiar with it or gaslight their patients into believing there's nothing truly wrong. I talk about this here. All right, so that's going to do it. Thanks for hanging out with me. I'm Danielle Minetti, and this has been Lucid Med. Lots of awesome stuff coming in 2024. I'll be doing regular live broadcasts, although I haven't decided on how frequent I'm going to do them. Let me know what you'd like and how you'd like to connect. I do also have a Patreon, so I kind of need to see how YouTube plays in the sandbox. And if I'm not crazy about it, we may need to head over to to there to patreon uh, we'll see and then in the coming weeks i'm going to be doing videos on the medicinal properties of psilocybin and the research going on there which i'm really really excited about so as always stay healthy and lucid and i'll see you next sunday